From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Issue one, a right to gay marriage. This ruling will strengthen all of our communities by offering to all loving same-sex couples the dignity of marriage across this great land. In a landmark 5-4 to four decision, the Supreme Court has ruled under the 14th Amendment, gay marriage is a legal right of same-sex couples across America. Gay couples and liberals have reacted to the news with great excitement. Until now, gay marriage was illegal in 14 states. But now those state legislatures will have to yield to federal authority. And that makes many conservatives furious. Justice Scalia referred to the majority's ruling as a descent into the, quote, mystical aphorisms of the fortune cookie, unquote. And other conservatives have warned civil disobedience might follow. Congressman Steve King, a Republican social conservative whose donors and speaking summits make him influential with GOP presidential candidates, recently offered a grave warning. We had the Dred Scott decision. The Supreme Court decided they were going to end the slavery question with a, Supreme, with a Dred Scott Supreme Court decision. Well, that turned into a civil war. 600,000 people killed to put an end to slavery to sort that mess out. Question, what does this mean for America? Eleanor. Uh, well, I feel proud of my country. I feel proud of my court. I mean, we have moved from uh, looking at an issue as though caricat caricaturizing it as a perversion to saying that the that LGBT people are have a human and a right and a civil right to marry whoever they want and love whoever they want. So this is a sweeping decision, all 50 states. And uh, this ruling joins other landmark uh, cases, Roe v. Wade, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, Loving versus Virginia. Uh, and I guess my only concern is uh, there will be resistance. So what form will this resistance take? <coughs> and I look to the Republican presidential candidates to find their voice on this and to, I hope, set the right tone. Yeah, I, I, right. And, and I think to be fair, you know, Republicans have actually taken a, 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 a really actually you know, across the board in terms of the presidential candidates that I've seen so far, taking it a, a say, well, look, we disagree with this, but we are a country of laws. We have to abide by that. You know, they should have push against that element, which is going to come out the Steve King element and sort of talk about, you know, Dred Scott and a new civil war and all this kind of ridiculousness, because that's what it is. Uh, we are a country of laws. I think we have to be careful, though, in the sense that going forwards, that people of religious faith do not feel that they are going to be a pressured here now to lose charity status, for example, in terms of their decisions, that private business owners are going to have protections. Uh, and so, look, the debate will go forwards. Um, but again, you know, it, it is, it's, it's good to see people happy. I, I've said before that, you know, that my generation, I think, see, we see kids without homes. There's a potential for adoption there. Uh, if people want to be in a committed, monogamous relationship, that is a positive public health reasons, et cetera, et cetera. But so it's, it's well, a I big... Well, I think that's important to talk about generational differences mm -hmm. here because what, what astounds me is, you know, ten, five, ten years ago, uh, I would have said, in fact, I think I, I wrote, I didn't expect to see gay marriage legalized in my lifetime. Look what's happened in the last decade. What'd you write? It's astounding. Well, you know, just, just the, the fact that uh, while, while I personally favor it, you know, I, I don't expect the country to swing that way, but I think that's very significant, though. The fact is that this court is really following the national lead. They, they see, or at least the majority of this court sees, <laughs> that the country's attitudes have changed and are in the process of changing. And that's why, while, while I'm concerned, as Eleanor is, about backlash, like what we saw with Roe versus Wade, I think the Roe versus Wade decision back there in 72 was a much more abrupt and shocking shock to the system for the country nationwide, whereas I think the country is much more ready well, for this. Is Congressman King trying to say that it's sometimes better for the court to refrain from pushing too fast on social questions? Too so fast for him. Well, now, wait a minute. I'm, well, <laughs> no, no, here, no, give, let me finish. Yeah, so that there can be time for political solutions to develop. He's pointing out that as a matter of historical fact, when the court acts before there is a social consensus, the results can be disastrous. Yeah, but right. we've seen right. the consensus emerge over the last 10 years. In 2004, there were anti-gay measures put on, key, on ballots in key states, battleground states, to bring out the anti-gay vote. I mean, today, 
being pro-gay is a positive thing. So the country has flipped, and I, I think it's something like 67 percent now favors same-sex marriage. You still want to protect the rights of people who disagree, but they are the minority. The court, as Clarence said, is following the the public opinion in this country. Except for the Scalia Thomas Wing, but I'll well, say that. Well, yes, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, the rulings this week made me feel like the well, like the, the the liberal court what? Brown was back. I mean, yeah. where did this come from? This is supposed to be a conservative yeah. court, and they're ruling uh, yeah. quite positively on more liberal issues. You think polygamy is next in line for legitimation? Oh. Well, or po I, polyandry? I, 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 on one level, I hope so, because I would like to live long <laughs> enough to see that happen. You're into polygamy? That, that would add a lot to my life, is all I can you say. You got any plans more? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think that would be quite, quite an well, interesting thing. No, that's, that's a legitimate argument. I mean, right. uh, Scalia brought that up way back uh, right. over a dozen years ago with the right. Texas uh, a gay uh, cohabitation right. case. Actually, what? Actually, what? Yeah, Judge, Judge Alito, Texas. in his questioning, because they've been playing the the oral arguments. I mean, he right. he said, "What if if uh, two men and two women came? Could they could they get together?" And he also suggested, "What if they were all lawyers? Does that make them a natural grouping?" I mean, right. I, I think the key, uh, it was rather I bizarre. The, the, the key here is that if you see the people who were actually taking their case to the court in terms of the specifics that they had, yes, marriage originally in a religious institution. You have to re respect that, and I get that. Uh, especially as a person of faith, but at the same time, where you have a couple who want, uh, who are in their hearts married and want to have that commitment and can't, you know, have the, the benefits if one of them is ill, or to, there's a real. Uh, I think Fourteenth Amendment really came into play on that. Let's take an exit question here. Are we in danger of civil disobedience by some states defying the federal government? I think we, we will see civil disobedience by some churches, by some uh, ministers, maybe you know, bakers of wedding cakes. I mean, that, that sort of thing is, is yeah. going to go I on. The important thing I here, think. right, the important thing here is, is that the, the, the court has put the Constitution on the side of freedom. That's the important thing here, and I, I think that's unshakable. The, you know, everything else is around the I edges. I think legislatures around the country and the states that have banned gay marriage may try to come up with legislative maneuvers, probably more religious freedom laws. Mm -hmm. I think they will think proliferate, right. but uh, you know, again, it's that that arc of history <laughs> bending towards mm. uh, social justice, and it continues. You know what? You know who love this? Family law attorneys. Mm. It opens up a whole new customer base for prenuptial agreements, divorce cases, child custody, alimony, child support. On the, the other hand, yeah. John, John, let's be serious, the, the, the divorce rate has been skyrocketing for over 50 years. I mean, lawyers have got plenty of business on that end already. <laughs> the irony these days is the one group that wants to get married is gay folks. I mean, the, you know, well, you're a lawyer, right? folks, their get marriage rate has been declining in recent years. And Are that's you a lawyer? Issue. Say again? Are you a lawyer? Am I a lawyer? No, I just play one on TV. Or, or try to act <laughs> like one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Is your wife a lawyer? No. I thought there was a, law, some, a lawyer there somewhere. No, we just sound like it, that's all. <laughs> yeah, well, congratulations, no, no I guess, I guess. Set. Issue two, Obamacare wins. President Obama's birthday isn't until August, but this week, Mr. Obama received a matchless early gift. The Supreme Court upheld the nationwide subsidies that support Mr. Obama's health care overhaul. In a six to three vote, the justices ruled that the revenues that make health insurance more affordable for 8.3 million people are not controlled by where individuals live, as opponents had asserted, but by their needs, is President Obama. This morning, the court upheld a critical part of this law, the part that's made it easier for Americans to afford health insurance regardless of where you live. If the partisan challenge to this law had succeeded, millions of Americans would have had thousands of dollars worth of tax credits taken from them. For many, insurance would have become unaffordable again. Many would have become uninsured again. Ultimately, everyone's premiums could have gone up. America would have gone backwards. And that's not what we do. That's not what America does. We move forward. Question, what was the majority's reasoning in finding that the subsidies are legal? Boy. Well, I mean, I think it was very hard for them to maintain their previous 
analysis, uh, legal analysis, for this was just simply so completely f away from where America had come, I just don't see how they could have done it. And I think they paid attention attention to that very fact. Well, well, I think Justice Roberts' yeah. opinion, he, he looked at the context of the law. As I, as I was saying earlier, it reminded me of, uh, of, of uh, the first Mayor Daley in Chicago, his press secretary told the reporters, don't report what the mayor says, report what he means. <laughs> right. Well, you know, Scalia was looking at what the law says, and Justice Roberts was looking at the whole context of it, saying, right. well, Congress obviously did not mean to destroy the, uh, right. the system they were setting up. Right. And, and so, so there's two different kinds of logic right. there, but that was the reason. Right. And, I think and the Chief Justice referred to an amicus brief that was submitted by the health insurance industry, and they said without the subsidies, people could not afford uh, this insurance. They would drop out of the market. Only the sickest people would be in, and that would lead to the so-called death spiral. I, I, it would basically right. kill the law. And so he listened to that, and the health industry in this country is huge. It's $2.9 trillion part of the sector. Mm -hmm. And if those subsidies had been taken away, it would have cost $31 billion in the, to these insurance uh, companies. I, I obviously wrote a piece about this, so I'm familiar with the figures. And I'm so this was, a pro, <laughs> this was a pro-business decision. This would have been hugely unsettling I, I, to the people, to the insurance industry markets, and uh, uh, this well, Chief see, Justice wasn't going to do that. Between, between the statutory interpretation in the moment, I think it was a, you know, a statutory interpretation. Look, the, 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 you, you have to read the law. I, I disagree with Justice Roberts is how he read it, but he was looking at that specific statutory interpretation versus the statutory effect, right? If he had ruled the other way, it would have, as he created, created a, de a death spiral. It would have impinged upon the clear intent of Congress, even if the law, uh, in terms of its statutory you know, findings, or statutory language, was not clear. So, look, I mean, and it's generating a lot of controversy, but it is what it is now. Uh, I, I have to say, as a conservative, as much as I disagree with him, I'm a fan of Chief Justice Roberts. He writes eloquent opinions. He writes specifics. It's accessible to, to laymen. And... Uh, you know, it is what it is. Justice Scalia suggested that instead of calling it Obamacare, the law should be called SCOTUS care. <laughs> because the that's Supreme Court of the United <laughs> States, that's SCOTUS, it's S-C, yes. O-T-U-S, has kept it alive through statutory interpretation. Does Scalia have a point? Well, right. Scalia has kept uh, kept things lively with his opinions right. lately, right. sounding more and more like an eloquent uh, right-wing talk show host all the time. <laughs> right. uh, but uh, yeah, he was saying that. Well, what he was saying was that that he was accusing Roberts of legislating from the bench. And yeah, this is what people say when they don't like the ruling. But the fact is that uh, Roberts wasn't writing the law. He was trying to get down to the law's real intent. Now, had he gone the other way and overturned all of the Obamacare law based on those few words out of context, that would have been legislating in my right. view, but I'm just an ordinary citizen. And in citizen. the very yeah. cogent opinion that he wrote for the majority, he quoted mm -hmm. Justice Scalia from past cases yep. saying you have to take things in context, you have to look at the intent, you don't just pull four words out and distort the meeting. So he basically threw that right back at Scalia. Now Sc Scalia has lost two big ones here, oh, yeah. and he doesn't like it, <laughs> but uh, he still remains a very I, strong I also justice. Think there's, 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 and one, there's one other uh, element of this bill or that really is worrisome. If you are under 30 hours, okay, you don't get any of the subsidies. Right. And a lot of jobs, including a lot of jobs of the people in this very building, mm -hmm. are now being reduced to under 30 hours in order for the companies, the employers, not having to pay whatever it was to make those right. uh, health care things. Do you have any actual that, figures on that, though? Well, but, I've heard that that was true mm -hmm. in the beginning, but now with the economy improving, that, that that's diminishing as far as the... But, uh, but, but, but also younger so. Americans in terms of our premiums, that's going to be the debate. Republicans have a real opportunity there because we are paying a hell of a lot for not a good service. Well, in terms congratulations of, uh, well, to any Republican who can come up with a meaningful change to this law that <laughs> doesn't right. make things worse. Uh, uh, it's uh, very it's difficult. It's I all intertwined. Well, they don't have a consensus yeah. around any single yeah. alternative. That's, that's that the is, problem. That is true. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Uh, who benefits the more from this decision, Democrats or Republicans? And this the decision, answer and is the everybody. Republicans benefit most. The decision deprives the Democrats of a powerful issue to energize their base. But the Republicans can keep rallying their base with promises of a legislative repeal of Obamacare. 
I see what you're driving at, but I think you're <laughs> underestimating the benefit to Democrats. In fact, I think both sides, but politically, both sides win. Uh, the Obamacare issue is still alive. Uh, now, the the Demo Democrats got to fight. It goes to politics, right? It right. goes to political yeah, debate. Right. And, and, and Democrats have got to fight to save, uh, save and, it and, and to expand it. Look at all those people when in a lot states of people that, are that being, don't have Medicaid expansion. Mark, and when a lot issue. of people are being employed to keep under that 30-hour uh, divide, okay, mm -hmm. you're going to feel uh, there's going to be a lot of re reaction to that yeah, kind of thing. Republicans could fix that, that in a, the Republicans could fix that in a minute years. with legislation if they wanted to. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, those I'm are those couldn't. are tweaks. That's, that's, that's not, the, that's but not. But it's not. an important tweak because no, it's I, millions I agree. of people. Uh, I agree it's an important tweak needs to be made, but you haven't seen that much of a fuss to make it. No. I mean, I, I wish there was more of a fuss. Issue three, Obama's fast track. We also have the best workers in the world. We also have the best businesses in the world. And when the playing field is level, nobody beats the United States of America. Nobody beats the United States of America. Just do it, everybody. Thank you. God Just you. do it. That has been President Obama's rallying cry to Congress for many months. And this week, following tough negotiations and razor-thin procedural votes, the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate ultimately granted fast-track trade authority to President Obama. Fast-track authority is a process that was first used by President Richard Nixon. It allows a president to negotiate trade deals without congressional amendment and then submit those deals for final approval by Congress. And now, with his fast-track authority in hand, President Obama hopes to finalize major trade deals with Asia and the European Union. But in the case of the Asia-focused free trade deal, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, fast-track opposition was particularly strong among liberals and anti-free trade conservatives. They fear that the TPP will mean American jobs being shipped overseas to cheaper workforce locations. In contrast, TPP supporters, including many Republicans who allied with President Obama to approve this authority, believe that the TPP will strengthen the economy by allowing American businesses to sell goods and services to emerging markets overseas. Question, the Wall Street Journal held its annual conference of global chief financial officers this month. Only 22% said the Trans-Pacific Partnership would help their companies. The other 78% said it would either hurt their companies or make no difference. Are TPP's benefits overrated? Clarence. Uh, first of all, Pat, or, or John, thank you for letting me sit in Pat Buchanan's chair uh, this week. Well, uh, then you know what your answer must be. I have, uh, yeah. Well, in his honor, I'd have to say I'm against TPP. I'm not really against it. I'm a critic, though, of of the uh, secrecy surrounding the negotiations so far, or or, or the, the fact that even even members of Congress can can look at it, but they can't uh, uh, talk about it openly, even among themselves, and all that just arouses more suspicion about something that a lot of Americans find to be dubious in the first place but I think on balance it's going to to, uh, to benefit Americans but uh, there are going to be some folks on, on on the loser side as well but that always happens with, with trade deals yeah I mean, this, this is a better trade deal than most it does have environmental protections in it and worker protections and they are going to pass another piece of legislation on trade assistance adjustment and the Republicans have agreed to support that because that's what the Democrats want so trade deals have been oversold in the past Democrats are rightfully suspicious suspicious, but I think yeah. you know, this Democrats is the wave said, of the said future. That the assistance is overrated, too. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, this, I is, agree. This, is, this is good news for America. We cannot race to the bottom. You see China struggling in terms of its economic growth because it's having to compete with nations like Vietnam and the Philippines. You have to have an, a, a workforce that, you know, we talk about energy as an, a good example of a potential there, but a workforce that can provide goods and services at an American comparative advantage, sell them abroad, take advantage, think technology companies. But also there's a great advantage in terms of the benefits that free trade can bring to American consumers across the country. You know, some people will lose out. That I mean, I'm not going to pretend I understand yeah. that. It's, it's, it's well, bad, but American that. consumers will win here because you get cheaper goods. That helps American oh, families please, struggling to pay please. their bills. When you've got uh, a sweeping one trade deal that three out of four chief financial officers see as irrelevant or harmful to their business, 
No. You know, you know that this thing. This you thing also is, know when I'm Republicans gonna, agreeing I'm with President Obama. I'm going to be skeptical Obama. on the yeah. other side. If we've got these chief financial officers for these big firms saying it's bad for them, hey, maybe it's maybe. good for the workers. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, what's the what's right. the next big hurdle for Obama, President Obama? Excuse me. Now that he has fast track authority, what? Well, he better. Um, as a starter, arrange for some very good trade arrangements with various countries mm -hmm. and bring them to the country, to this country, and be able to show that these are actually positive steps for our own economy and for employment. Because employment is the big issue now because we have so many unemployed people. And if we can get more of that here, then it would be fine. Well, he's mm -hmm. got to negotiate with the other, it's like almost a dozen right. nations, and Japan is the heavyweight mm -hmm. there, and to get the right uh, concessions out of Japan. He's yes, now he strengthened because he does have the right. Congress behind him. Uh, but once he gets the deal, then Congress, I think, gets 60 days to mm -hmm. yeah. you know, there's, vote there's up or down. Right, yeah. uh, so it, it ain't also, over yet. I, wanna, <laughs> I, I throw a little curveball here at uh, the people like Elizabeth Warren who talk about liberal morality. Well, you know what? There's one undeniable part of this, that it will benefit poorest people around the world in terms of giving them access to global markets and the e economic growth there. Um, so that's well, just a little bit of a here, hypocrisy, though, hypocrisy I think. I don't want to hear some no. of the, so much of a Puritan. Uh, uh, well, the, the issue is benefiting poor people here. Uh, there's, right. there's little question right. that the disappearance, or the hollowing out of the middle class in America since the 50s has come largely because of jobs but being globalization exported. Is inevitable, oh, globalization is inevitable, I think. Yeah, it's you know. inevi but it is and inevitable. I'm, I'm you can fight it or you it can try is, and use it. It is, and that's, uh, that's, that is the issue. How do, how do you use it? How do you raise right. the skill level of America? Exit question on a leak scale from zero to ten. Zero meaning no leaks whatsoever. The Dutch boy, Dutch boy has his finger in the dike. And 10 meaning massive inundation, Snowden-like style. What's the likelihood that the TPP deal will find its way onto the internet via WikiLeaks 0 to 10? You follow that? Two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's strange. Uh, I'm thinking over at WikiLeaks, they're saying boring. I'll go with a two asleep. also, right? <laughs> Issue four, two tails of one flag. My hope is that by removing a symbol that divides us, we can move forward as a state in harmony and we can honor the nine blessed souls who are now in heaven. Nikki Haley, South Republican Carolina governor of South Carolina, Carolina calling on her state's House and Senate to remove the Confederate flag from their Capitol grounds. The governor is not wasting time. She says that if a vote on the flag's removal isn't held before the summer recess, she will force an emergency vote. Governor Haley made the announcement following a week of introspection over the murder of nine black worshippers at a church in Charleston. The killer, Dylan Storm Roof, was motivated by white supremacist ideology. And while many in South Carolina continue to support the Confederate flag as a symbol of states' rights and human courage in battle, Much the darker. governor disagrees. But we are not going to allow this symbol to divide us any longer. The fact that people are choosing to use it as a sign of hate is something that we cannot stand. The fact that it causes pain to so many is enough to move it from the Capitol grounds. It is, after all, a capital that belongs to all of us. Question, is Governor Haley right? Is it time for the South Carolina legislature to furl the Confederate flag? Clarence Page. Well, I thought it was long past time to move the Confederate flag into a museum where it belongs. But what's interesting to me is how quickly public opinion seems to have shifted uh, in favor of, of, of retiring the flag here in recent days, especially since this terrible tragedy there in Charlotte. It reminds me of the church bombing in Birmingham back in 63, mm -hmm. where minds were just changed overnight in many ways. That, that, that bombing people in a church or shooting people in a church is just so far beyond the pale. And the other thing is that j just nationally, we have uh, moved beyond that now in many ways. And many South Carolinians were concerned about the economic impact, among other things, yeah. of, uh, of uh, appearing to be still stuck in the past. Right, and that the flag uh, was erected on the South Carolina State House grounds in 1962 as a symbol of defiance against, yeah. uh, seg uh, against integration. Right. And so it really is a, a, right. a hateful symbol to people alive today who uh, are not seeing it in the context of a of a war that was fought, but they're seeing it how how it's been uh, perverted, 
uh, right. in, in its current use. Yeah. She, uh, Nikki Haley only has limited powers. She's got to get the legislature involved. In Alabama, mm -hmm. also a Republican governor, he just, he was able just through an edict to uh, remove the flag. I, hold on. There are calls for Confederate symbols to come down across the South. And in Texas, vandals have defaced Civil War era monuments to Confederate statesmen and troops who died in the war. Do all Confederate symbols need to be destroyed? I ask you. No, of course not. I think the reason why it had to come down in the Capitol is the Capitol is a special place in the democratic representation of the people, all the people, right? Uh, it has to represent all the people. It did not do that. But at the same time, the Confederate flag, I think this is important. I don't think we, we have to back away from some of this rhetoric now. You know, these stupid bans that some computer, you know, that Apple have put this ban on this computer game. It is part of the fabric of history to some people. Yeah. You know, I, I know it's easy for me to say as a, you know, as, as a white man. They're making market decisions they, based okay, on Okay, and, but I think we need to be yeah. careful here so in the that's sense. Their, that's we have okay, Well, but we have to be careful in the sense that to, to a lot of people in the South, it is a representation of courage in battle and of states' rights against majoritarian government, which is important in terms of political correctness. Most but yes, people's but minds, yes, it's, it, about, yeah. it's about the preservation yeah. of slavery. Okay, but and you know, so we need to acknowledge still, that Okay, but well. in the private <laughs> domain, we still have to, I think, respect people who want to fly that. Yeah. Should history books be racist. purged of any discussion of the Confederacy for fear of committee microaggressions? No. No, 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 no absolutely not. not. <laughs> but this is a public a symbol. Mm -hmm frankly, that is seen by a lot of people as in reinforcing segregation. Right. I mean, and that's something that it seems to me is time to put away for the moment. Yeah, there's the second history of this flag, like Eleanor mentioned, in the early 1960s, states across the South who wanted to resist desegregation uh, uh, laws and, uh, and rulings uh, began to make a, a, a banner uh, out of the old battle flag. And this is the Confederate battle flag we're talking and about. And, and, and so yeah, now it's got a special me on. racist and meaning to it. To Walmart and Amazon and other retailers ban any merchandise that displays the Texas Lone Star Elmo. No. That's, that's up to them. It's up to them, making, isn't it? Right. It's up to them. They're making their decision. Force prediction. Will the U.S.-Iran deal be President Obama's fourth victory? Yes or no? Uh, eventually, yes. Eleanor. <laughs> yes. No. I hope not. I think it's a terrible deal for the United States. The answer is no. Bye-bye. <laughs>